joined with the brethren who came before me tonight and welcome everybody here. We're going to spend a little time continuing with our study of First Peter, and we'll close classes our custom prop time with a prayer. In First Peter chapter one, we were told by simply writing the information that is that Peter gave us about impending persecution. No doubt these brethren had already been undergoing some persecution, but like those addressed in the Hebrews epistle, they may have been having much uh, harder times ahead of them. And being that Peter's the apostle to the Jews, then we can understand that there would have been a great many uh, Jew, Jewish Christians. And of course, this is part of the New Testament, so it pertains to all people. But originally in the first century, no doubt it would have a lot of, of Jewish Christians. And of course, they would be very familiar with the Old Testament, but they've heard the gospel and they have been baptized, born of water and spirit, as Ken just studied, John 3, 3 and 5. And now they have been living for at least some time the Christian life. And we see that brought out at the end where we stopped last week of chapter 1 when he says in verse 25 but the word of the Lord endureth forever and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you if you look back up in verse 23 he says being born again not of corruptible seed well it's interesting we just heard a lesson on being born again John 3.3 3. And here he says we're born a seed that's incorruptible. The word of God. Luke 8, 11 declares the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. And the word of God lives and abides forever. But isn't it interesting that he says we're born of, the, of this incorruptible word? Well, how is it that a person can be born of an incorruptible word? Because it delivers to us and the meaning of those words, the will of heaven, that we must believe and comply with in order to be saved by God through Christ. That's how we're saved, by the incorruptible word. And notice it's incorruptible. You can't corrupt it. Now, men, of course, go about teaching compromised doctrine, adding to it, subtracting from it, altering in some way. But the actual word can't be corrupted. Thus, what it means now it'll mean on the day of judgment. What it says on the day of judgment, it says right now. So the study that Ken just led us through on the new birth, being born of water and the spirit, uh, actually baptism, is going to mean on the day of judgment just what it does now. So we need to have that kind of confidence in God and in his revelation. His mind has been revealed to us, Second Timothy 3, 16, and 17. It is the perfect law of liberty, James 1, verse 25. Now, I said in the beginning, we must remember these brethren are being persecuted for righteousness sake. In other words, they're being persecuted simply because they're Christians. And the gospel they preach, and the gospel they live, and the gospel they defend. And that is so uh, diametrically opposed to the immorality that was... Uh, commonplace, and permeated the Roman world. So therefore, they had to understand that you must set your hopes on heavenly things. And he spends the first chapter saying, this life is brief, and you must not let the affairs of this life, as Satan uses them to persecute you, even maybe take your life, cause you to give up the incorruptible word the very gospel you obey and the truth that you live as Christian is by that word, the incorruptible seed. The same thing, the same word that made you a Christian when you believed and obeyed it is the same word that keeps you faithful as you live in the church serving God. So with that in mind, coming into what we have in chapter two, again, I know you know this, but I say it for emphasis sake, there were no chapters and verses in this letter as we originally given. So we see in what we have is chapter 2, the word wherefore. 
Well, that again points us back to what has been said previously. In view of the fact that we were saved by the word of the Lord, verse 25, that endures forever. And this is the gospel which by the, uh, this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, in the light of what I've just told you, those facts that you know, those facts that I'm emphasizing, those facts of the truth that will keep you, though you're persecuted for righteousness sake, wherefore laying aside all malice. So he's talking about anger, intense anger. And we're to lay those things aside. Now notice it's our responsibility to will to put those things out of our lives. It's not going to happen by just praying to God and saying, remove it from me. That doesn't mean I shouldn't be praying about it. It means that prayer will only do what prayer will do. It will not take the place of your willing to do what's necessary to bring it about. God will do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. But wherein we can do, he expects us to act. An example of that, when the children of Israel were fleeing Pharaoh, and he was about to catch them. God caused a great pillar of fire to come between the children of Israel and Pharaoh. And at night, there was a great cloud. In other words, it kept them from getting there. Well, there's a reason for that. There was a great host of thousands and thousands of people. And God made the way also through the Red Sea. Now, they, they couldn't get across that sea in and of themselves by their own human power. But God made it where they could. And he caused that great fire to be behind them, separating Pharaoh's armies from them and protecting them until they could all get across. Well, notice what you've got in that little town. They had to do something, and what they had to do, God wasn't going to do for them. But what they couldn't do, God took care of. You know, that would uh, relieve a great many problems out of our lives. We'd realize if we just tend to our own business and let God tend to him. I suppose we're going to pray about anything, praying without ceasing. It's let us discern the difference and then act according. So wherefore, laying aside, that's my business. I'm to read, I'm to understand, I'm to understand what malice is, and I'm to know the will of God says, get rid of it. Whatever you've got to do to get it out of your system, get rid of it. And this was said to Christians, which tells me then that Christians can have wrong thoughts and wrong motives and act in the wrong way. You must stop yourself from doing it. Notice an all guile and hypocrisy and envy and all evil speaking. Summing all up, he's saying, you must be faithful. You must keep the commandments of God that pertain to being faithful to God. So, he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Notice that though they've been Christians for some time, that's what we see back up in verse 23, 24, and 25 of the preceding chapter, chapter 1. But notice right here, what they must do. The sentence doesn't end with verse 1. Notice verse 2. What are we to do to be able to lay these things aside? To make sure we put them out of the way. They're not, that they're not a part of us. Because these things are world. Read Galatians 5. You see the works of the flesh. These fit right in with that. So he says, as newborn babes. Desire the sincere milk of the word. That you may grow thereby. There's never a time that that admonition in verse 2 is not important to each one of us who are Christian. We ought to always be desiring the milk of the word. Now, milk usually is used, as does the Hebrews writers, to indicate someone that's not mature spiritually as a babe that lives on milk. But the point made here is that you should want the word of God that's incorruptible as much as a newborn babe desires the milk. 
it doesn't mean here necessarily that you're feeding on the milk of the word. It means that you follow the example of a newborn baby's desire, its intense desire to have milk. And thus, that ought to be something that's characteristic of all of us. And that reminds us what Jesus said in the Beatitudes when he pronounced a blessing upon those in Matthew 5 who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now remember, all of God's commandments are righteousness. Psalms 119, verse 172. So when we hunger and thirst after righteousness, what are we hungering and thirsting at? The commandments of God, the word of God, the word of God that's incorruptible, that abides forever. Because how are we going to let God have his way with us since we're free more like I must will for such to be? How do I will for such to be? I first of all know the word and what it requires of me. And then I seek to put it into practice. That's the way it works in time. That's when you talk about, if you talk about a medical doctor, you talk about somebody that practices medicine. Practices medicine. They, they keep uh, sharp because not only do they just read and study, and they have a medical background in a medical university, college, medical school, but they continue to keep themselves sharp and active by constantly studying, constantly feeding on things and doing it. When I was uh, over in Austin years ago, there was a brother who was not a member of that particular congregation who taught thoracic surgery he was getting about retirement time at that point. We were visiting one day when he was down for other reasons. And uh, he said, you know, if I, if I miss a couple of days of doing surgery, I can tell the difference if I miss a couple of days and how quickly and efficiently I can get the particular operation done. He said, it's just that way. Well, think about that when it comes to living every day, every second of every minute of every hour of every day in submission to the Lord's will. Well, if you aren't used to doing that, if that's not your desire, and of course, as you read the Hebrews epistle, the inspired writer really scolded those brethren because they had not been using the will of God in determining right and wrong. When he said, you have need again of one teaching you the first principles of the oracles of God. You're not able to handle strong meat. You've got to start over. Well, that's true of a lot of things. And I simply cite the matter of a medical doctor or surgeon as an example of that. But it's true of practicing law. It would be true of practicing about anything. You have to keep on doing it. And what about Christian living? Well, if it doesn't cover Christian living, seeing that, that should encompass all of our life, all day long, every day, and it involves hungering, as it were, and thirsting after righteousness, that's how much we want to know the truth that we can put into practice, and I don't know uh, what it would apply to. So you see it again coming out here in what Peter is saying to these brethren who need this, that they can withstand this great uh, tri trial of their faith. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envy and evil, all evil speaking. Now, John would say, we just finished first, second, third John. John would say, little children love one another. And you won't treat them this way. A hypocrite is somebody who pretends to be something he's not. Uh, Hippocrates is the Greek word. And it's, it's the actual playing part. And so envies and all of these things they're simply works of the flesh. Well, a Christian is to be putting those things away because you know that the Bible, the New Testament in particular, does not sanction such things. That takes effort on our part. God will not do it for you. As once I said concerning the teaching of the New Testament as to praying to God, we should pray to God as if everything depended on God, and then we should work as if everything depended on us. Now, God will do his part. A lot of times he won't do his part until we do ours. So as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. You know, we're either growing 
and greater knowledge and practice of the truth over sliding backwards. You can't just say, well, I'll, I've reached this stage. I don't need to reach anymore. I know as much as I need to know. I don't need to study my Bible anymore. I don't need to pray. I don't need to work on anything in my life. I've been doing this for 30 years, and that's enough. Well, we lose what we don't use. That's just as clear as it can be in about anything. And in the examples I use of the surgeon and so forth, that's what happens. You lose things when you don't use them. I don't care how well you're educated, how high your IQ is. If you don't use it, you lose it. So as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. Now he says something here that's interesting in verse 3. If so be, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Well, if you look back over into Hebrews 6 and verse 5, you may have something there that will help you in what he's saying. Hebrews 6, 5 says, And have tasted of the good word of God and the power of the world to come. Now he's talking about people there who, who were actually, as Jewish Christians, due to persecution, about to give up the New Testament system. And he's saying if they have gone through this and they just give it up willingly, then you won't be able to renew them to repentance. Notice verse 4. For it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the power of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucify and to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open chain. Now, that's not just talking about being overtaken in a trespass. That's talking about a willful departing from the whole system of salvation that is the New Testament. Thus, we're seeing, if so be ye have tasted the Lord's gracious. Well, remember Titus 2, 11, 12, that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared, hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness of worldly lust, that we should live righteously, soberly, and godly in this present world or age. Well, that's what he's saying right here. I'm quite sure that these things were taught routinely. They may have been said a different way to apply to different situations by those preachers and apostles, as we see here. In fact, Peter being the apostle to the Jews, then this letter was circulated very quickly among those that received the Hebrews epistle because this addressed primarily the Jewish Christians. So if so be you've tasted the Lord's grace, if you've tasted the word of God, if you've been enlightened of the gospel, it's God's power to save you, and you believed it and obeyed it, well, they had, they're Christian. Notice this is what you have in verse 2 of chapter 1. He's addressing those who are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Then he says, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So these people have heard the gospel. They're Christians. They're members of the Lord's church, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Now, they're being persecuted because they're simply Christians. And how much worse it was going to get, I don't know, but evidently it was going to get quite a bit worse. It's going to be pictured as being tried by fire. So he says, now, if you have tasted, it's not that I don't know whether you have or you haven't. It's just simply saying, since you have tasted of it, you know the truth. You have from the heart obeyed the gospel. You know you've been added to the church by the Lord. You know what the truth is. Then here's the way that you're to act. Notice how he elaborates on this. To whom coming as unto a living stone. This is what you did when you obeyed the gospel. Disallowed indeed of men, the Jews rejected it, but chosen of God, because the Jews rejected it, didn't mean he ceased to be the Messiah, that he wasn't chosen of God. Remember, God said plainly, This is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. He said that at the Mount of Transfiguration. Notice, but chosen of God and precious. Now he addresses them directly again. You are ye also, in other words, as that was true of Christ, as 
followers of Christ, as members of the church, as Christians or Christians of Christ, you're a living stone. Dr. Sanders says, lively stones. And you're built up a spiritual house. We often talk about the building the church meets in sometimes is the church. Well, we shouldn't because it's just simply the building the church meets in does other things the Lord authorizes the church to do in that building. All right. Well, what are we to do? We're the spiritual house. We're God's spiritual family. First Timothy 3.15, Paul said, If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Well, as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. Then he emphasizes something about that spiritual house and a holy priesthood. Now, of course, they would know about the Levitical priesthood and what the priests did, including the high priests, around the tabernacle and later the temple and how they worshiped according to the law of Moses. But now, of course, we know that every member of the spiritual temple, a place of worship in the Christian age, is a priest. And we go through our high priest, who's Jesus Christ, the only mediator between God and man. So each one of us are priests that we can offer our own sacrifice. Nobody stands, no human being stands between us and God. So ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood. Holy means set apart for that purpose, to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Think for a moment what is said by Paul in the Roman epistle in chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, let me ask this. How is your mind renewed in spiritual things? By the incorruptible word. You wouldn't know a thing about what uh, God's will for your life if it wasn't for the incorruptible seed of the kingdom, the word of God. So that's the point he's making here to these people. What do they need to be mindful of? These folks that are trying to kill them and hurt them in some way or the other because they're Christians? Well, he's already dealt with that, didn't he, in the first chapter. Because he said you need to realize how brief and uncertain life is and your pilgrims and sojourners, Dr. Sanders uses the word sojourners, are strangers in this world. It's all going to pass away. Everything passes away. But that which abides forever are those that do the Lord's will. And there's where you need to have your mind. Well, your mind is renewed on the basis of doing what God said. And notice we'll see a new sentence starts here in verse 6. And we'll build on that next time we're together. Our class is about to run out here. But I will say when he says, wherefore, that once again refers back to what he just said. And a lot of these things it's contained that's contained in the scripture, behold, and I'll just go on from there because it opens up a whole uh, another idea here. Keep in mind this about it. These people were suffering because they're Christian. This letter is written for the suffering servants and reminding them this life is so brief and uncertain, and it's going to pass away. Don't let that which is brief and uncertain and the persecution the devil brings on you to cause you to lose your soul. Hold to God's unchanging hand. How do you do that? The incorruptible word will see you through. Well, let's go to Heavenly Father in prayer and then the class will be over. Would you bow with me? Our gracious and holy Father, we're so thankful we could be together in the midst of this busy week to study thy word together to meditate on it. May we do so day and night. Help us, Father, to teach it to others. And we pray in thy providential guidance that thou take us to those who are looking for the truth. And may more people in this country 
seek after spiritual things. And may we in the church be prepared to help them on their way to understanding the way of life that leads to heaven. We recognize our weaknesses and our shortcomings and our sins and pray mercy and forgiveness. And pray also, Father, that we'll be merciful and forgiving toward others as they repent of their sins. May we love the brethren, love the truth, and love thee with all that we are and have. Love our neighbor and ourselves. Guide us in all things that glorify thee. Defeat us in evil and raise us up in good. For we pray it in Christ's precious name. Amen.